everyone. Welcome to the Real Estate Red Zone, brought to you by the Real Estate Center at Texas A&M University. I'm Haley Reeder, Communications Specialist. Today is Wednesday, October 7th, 2020. On this day in 1759, hostile Native Americans lured a Spanish troop under Diego Ortiz Perea into a battle near fortified Tovaya Village on the Red River near the site of present-day Spanish Ford in Montague County. The Spaniards fought a four-hour battle against their numerically superior opponents, who included Comanches, Yaciales, and Tawakanis. As darkness fell, Ortiz Perea led an orderly withdrawal, though he was forced to leave a pair of cannons on the treacherous sandbank where the Spaniards had found themselves pinned down. The expedition thus failed its objective, which was to punish the natives responsible for the destruction of the Santa Cruz de San Saba mission in March 1759. Now on to today's podcast. The COVID-19 health crisis is unlike any the economy has experienced before. After the virus came to the nation in March, the U.S. and Texas economies underwent self-induced sudden stops to contain and stabilize the spread of the virus and save lives. The size of this economic shock will likely result in losses that overshadow those from the 2008 to 2009 financial crisis. Like the rest of the economy, Texas housing market will need more than just a bed rest and a couple of aspirin to fully recover from COVID-19. But so far, it's weathered the pandemic better than expected. Real Estate Center senior data analyst Joshua Robertson looked at the industry's response to the coronavirus, as well as its immediate outlook in his latest article, Anatomy of a Pandemic, Assessing Housing Market Damage and Recovery. He joins us today to share his insights. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Haley. What was the immediate response of the Texas real estate market when the first coronavirus-related restrictions came into place? Well, I'd even say before COVID restrictions came in place, things began to kind of slow down. Different events here and there starting to get canceled. And I think I think people were starting to uh, kind of wait trying to do the wait and see like what's going on. I I think they had kind of other things on their mind. And so uh, even before explicit restrictions, uh, things were slowing down uh, in the market. And uh, more specifically, things like listings were, um, you know, were dropping active listings. Uh, Of course, sales numbers were were, were dropping. And that kind of, you know, summarized not only all of April, but, you know, the later part of, of, of March. So things really just hit the brakes very quickly. Uh, and to no one's surprise, I mean, you know, for the most part, we didn't know at that time um, just how serious this was. And so trying to reinvent the, the whole uh, home buying process, something that is very much uh, reliant on, um, you know, in-person contact, you know, in-person visits, just trying to figure out what, how to best accommodate that that process in a way that could uh, alleviate people's uh, fears and concerns. So yeah, it it, it stopped very very quickly, and um, definitely definitely a shock. What housing market trends have been seen since mid March? Yeah, so I touched up on this just a little bit. I mean, just listings and sales. Uh, the the one I didn't mention, however, is uh, is home price. Uh, surprisingly, home price uh, didn't really budge, um, and for the most part, we think that that had to do with prices in April being really more of a reflection of deals done in March. So a little bit of a lag period. Uh, that's what we kind of first thought, and then it turned out that. Uh, home prices, for the most part, kind of stayed flat, and then going into the summer, uh, actually began to escalate. So that's been a little bit of a surprise. You know, I already touched up on on listings and and sales. Uh, really, when things kind of began to open back up in in May, you began to see. Well, it wasn't immediate, but you know, you began to see a little bit more activity early onset recovery of, of sales, but that really kind of happened more in June. 
How has home affordability fared the pandemic? Well, it hasn't fared too well. So as mentioned, home prices have uh, have continued to grow. And the, the biggest thing is that while sales, for the most part, in, you know, really kind of beginning more in June, uh, started to recover, the, uh, the listings did not. And so while there was a big shock in demand, uh, we we'll call demand, you know, based, based on the sales, you know, in, in April, uh, and likewise in, in, in supply, uh, the supply side never really got back on its feet. And so, uh, it's one of those interesting situations where you have both of those things, supply and demand, uh, retreating in tandem, you know, almost in equal measure, but, it looks like the um, and a lot a lot of this has to do with the the mortgage rates, uh, we believe. So, uh, mortgage rates being as low as they really can be, I think, created a sense of people not for those who you know felt more certain about their financial situation. Uh, I think it kind of created this sense of not wanting to miss this opportunity because, I mean, rates really. If you look at the spread between like the ten year. Uh, treasury and and what mortgage rates typically are I mean, it is really about as low as it can get right now so um, so that's really been it's a good thing for the market but in terms of affordability um, because of that that imbalance and and you know uh, supply and demand where demand uh, is is stronger than in the, the supply side uh, the prices have continued to to grow and that you know, we, we were already in a, a, a questionable housing affordability situation beforehand. So right. um, not only have prices, um, you know, continue to, to grow, but there's even fewer homes now. And, and in some markets, um, I've, I've talked about Austin at great length, you know, and other uh, avenues. But, um, you know, in Austin, for example, I mean, goodness, homes in the 200s are really hard to come. And I've heard a lot of, of course, anecdotal stories that kind of, that go with that. So, um, so yeah, it it hasn't gotten any better. And we're hoping that by kind of next housing, like next year, kind of when the the housing uh, cycle kind of comes back, that uh, maybe some of these listings will, will come back on the market. So we'll see. How has the pandemic affected Texas homeowners? And what about renters? Well, so one of the uh, one of the things that's happened since the the COVID pandemic is that there's been a lot more data points available, just kind of um, you know, particularly weekly data points that weren't available beforehand because you know we're so hungry trying to figure out what what is going on, uh, just trying to search for some sort of answers, and so uh, one of those uh, data sets has been the Census Bureau. Uh, household pulse survey, which basically takes a sample of, in this case, Texas residents, uh, homeowners, and uh, renters, and just tries to uh, gather just their overall sentiments and how they're you know feeling in, in the moment. So, one of the, um, I mean, and th- there's other ways that they divide the data, but for our purposes, homeowners and renters, uh, and one of the more striking um, uh, trends that we found is that homeowners in general feel for the most part fairly good I mean as much as you can but um, you know fairly optimistic about their housing situation specifically you know being able to uh, make their mortgage payments and having you know made their mortgage payments uh, while renters on the other hand not so much optimism um, a lot of that has to do with age and income. The, the renter population in these surveys is particularly young, uh, earlier in the career life cycle. Uh, many of them single, so you don't have the dual income factor. Uh, so that, that drives a lot of it. But, um, but yeah, definitely a difference in sentiment. And in fact, round two of the household poll survey has recently come out and as the follow-up question, how do you feel about, you know, 
eviction or foreclosure, which is the next step, you know, if, uh, if, you know, if you're in financial distress and it's, it's kind of the same story. Homeowners, for the most part, I mean, there, there are definitely acute situations where homeowners are in distress, but, uh, for the most part, you know, homeowners are also fairly optimistic about not being at risk of foreclosure. Uh, renters, on the other hand, you know, are, are definitely feeling uh, the pressure towards eviction. Uh, keep in mind that this survey was done right before the CDC guidelines, so it's kind of a final snapshot for that act, which, which actually kind of points to the importance of um, government intervention in, in, in this case. But, um, but yeah, definitely a big difference in sentiment. Uh, a lot of it driven by by just levels of income. Uh, there's a lot associated with that, you know, just job disruption in general. And and again, I touched up on the, uh, the dual income part, you know, compared to households. So, In your article, you mentioned a surge of rental activity in rural areas as many employees in larger cities discovered they can work just as efficiently remotely. Does this signal a potential urban flight trend in Texas? So I'm sure there's there's plenty of that going on in terms of the remote working. Um, there is definitely more activity in kind of the surrounding suburb areas. So going back to, to Austin and, and really San Antonio, because I, I would say that Comal County fits kind of right in between the two, depending on what city you're in. But there's definitely an uptick in activity in these, these types of markets. Uh, I'm not sure we're able to capture all the sentiments as, as to why that's, that's the case right now. Because, first of all, there, there is a quality of life you know, factor that goes into suburbs. And again, I kind of mentioned earlier that with the rates as low as they are, that could be kind of like a signal, like your green light. Like, this is now my chance to you know, make that push towards the suburbs. Um, in terms of that being a lasting trend, you know, once we're all said and done, I mean, people are still going to need jobs. And of course, urban centers are going to have their place with that. And I, I mentioned, um, so with, with the remote work, we're, we're starting to get some sense of how, you know, of course this can, this can change, but we're starting to get a sense of, uh, where remote work is going to have its, its place. Keep in mind that not every job is really equipped for remote work. In fact, I was reading a report from McKinsey and Company, a consulting firm, and they were kind of getting into uh, the future of kind of the workspace. And really, uh, there's just a handful of sectors that can really do um, uh, remote work. You know, I mentioned, you know, uh, information technology, finance, insurance. Um, of course, there, there's a handful, but those are the ones top my my mind. But even then, uh, and this was midsummer when they they surveyed. Uh, what they did was they surveyed a bunch of CEOs, and the general sentiment among the CEOs is that while we may have uh, re- remote work, uh, there's still going to be a push to have at least be in the office one, two, three days a week, and so that definitely changes the calculus versus remote remote work the entire time. So you'll still need to have access um, to the office. So, of course, this can all change. Um, You know, this was was midsummer, so a lot has changed. But um, the estimate that they had was that at least 80% of the jobs are not going to be able to do remote work. So that's why I kind of pumped the brakes some on on that that movement. and kind of lean towards additional explanations such as, you know, just your overall push towards the suburbs in, in general. That and the affordability factor, you know, you have more affordable homes out uh, away from the, the city centers. So, What should we expect to see going forward? So hopefully what we'll be seeing uh, going forward is, is more listings coming up. Um, some important factors that we'll be watching, of course, is just – in Texas, at least, you know, are, are we going to have another wave of, of COVID kind of like we did it in June? Uh, things have, cases have gone up some since the fall. I don't think people were that surprised because, you know, with the school factor. But 
uh, if we do end up having another significant wave like we did in June, what is that going to mean? You know, at that point, are we going to um, shut down? Are we going to add more restrictions? Are people going to be more hesitant to make major purchasing decisions? And then the other factor is, you know, just government uh, intervention. Uh, we've been under the umbrella of the uh, economic s- stimulus payments, the PPE, you know, the uh, eviction uh, foreclosure moratoriums. We've been under that umbrella. So are we going to be in a position to operate without those or are those going to be coming back? Um, that's going to take a while to see. And so I think in the, in the coming months towards a, you know, closing the year, I don't think people will be as surprised if things slow down just because a lot of that is, is seasonal, uh, whatever that means in 2020. But uh, just seeing how things start up in first quarter, I think that will really set the tempo for, you know, what's going to go, go on in the housing market. Well, thanks again for coming on. Thanks for having me. Thanks again, Josh. Don't forget to check out his article, Anatomy of a Pandemic, Assessing Housing Market Damage and Recovery, on our website. Click on the link on our podcast webpage to read it. You can also find this article in our latest issue of TG Magazine, set to hit mailboxes soon. We also posted a link to Josh's latest research articles and podcasts. For more on Texas housing, check out the Center's Texas Home Price Index and our Texas Housing Insight Report. We included a link to those on our podcast webpage and in the YouTube description box. The Real Estate Center has released a weekly economic indicator that can help forecast changes in the Texas economy resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. Click the link below for the latest updates. For even more from the Real Estate Center, check out our research library. It includes a wide variety of economic reports and real estate articles. Our latest topics include Texas border economy, equitable subrogation, iBuyers, Austin housing affordability, how death affects a real estate transaction, and more. We included a link to the research library on our podcast webpage. That's going to be it for today's podcast. If you want more from the Real Estate Center, head to our website. That's www.recenter.tamu.edu. There, you'll find the latest data, research articles, blogs, news, and more. You can also check out the Center's News Talk Texas database, which is updated daily with the biggest headlines in Texas real estate. You can also subscribe to Recon, our bi-weekly newsletter, to get all the biggest stories sent straight to your inbox. To stay up to date on when articles are published on our website, follow the Real Estate Center on social media. You can find us with the handle at RECenterTX on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. For more podcasts like these, you can subscribe on iTunes or to our YouTube channel. All podcasts are also available for free on our website. Thanks for joining us today in the Real Estate Red Zone, brought to you by the Real Estate Center in College Station, Texas. We've been helping Texans make the best real estate decisions since 1971. This is Haley Reeder, and I'll see you next time. Bye!